In chapter 13, we're looking at the Federal Reserve and the um, central banking system. So um, what we know here is that um, the central, the Federal Reserve has um, 12 regional banks. These 12 regional banks um, are actually not part of the government. Um, they are private corporations with the shares of the corporation owned by banks in that region. Now, the Federal Reserve Banks generally in the Federal Reserve System generally does um, earn a profit. Um, it earns a profit based on its vast holdings of treasuries, as well as, again, its processing um, checks and, and whatnot. So it generally does um, generate a profit, which is then returned to the treasury. But even though the Federal Reserve District Banks are private corporations, they exist under the Federal Reserve System, which has its membership um, selected by the president um, and confirmed by the Senate. And so even though we would say the Federal Reserve is not the government, it is the government at the same time. And so you'll be exploring this all in your term paper as well. Um, uh, and even when this slide was made in 2022, the criticism of um, the president, um, uh, President Trump at that time, was whether the Federal Reserve should remain independent. Um, we see those same kinds of questions uh, remaining today. And, you know, it's not, uh, I'm not trying to be political here when I state that. I mean, I th there is a... Um, a reason at least why we should at least talk about it and have a debate about it um, because it does um, actually um, uh, make sense to talk about whether that independence um, should continue to exist. Okay, <clears throat> so let's start here. Um, you know, again, you'll be looking at the um, you'll be looking at a lot of this with the term paper. Um, so I'll just kind of give the broadest overviews um, with the lecture. And that would be that um, this idea of having a central bank goes all the way back to um, Alexander Hamilton. No, I did not go see the Hamilton, um, what is a Broadway play or whatever. I know nothing about it. I know that the one guy is, um, then Emmanuel or something is, um, I don't know, using like, um, like it's, it's a funny narrative, I guess, but whatever. I don't know anything about, um, Hamilton. I guess if you've seen it, it probably would help you understand it, but I can't even say that with certainty because I didn't, uh, I've never seen it. But the idea is, like I said in the previous lectures, having a modern, financial system requires a, a strong banking system that was realized further back than Alexander Hamilton, but Hamilton brought that to the United States. And the idea was that we would have this bank of the U.S. to be the central bank. And so the first um, U.S. bank started in 1791. <clears throat> That's exactly the time that United States begins as a country, right? 1776, we get Declaration of Independence, um, and you get the Washington uh, presidency in the 1790s. Um, it has a 20-year charter. It expires in 1811, and um, there isn't enough support to renew its charter. Why? Well, dude, we're still in a time when there's this whole idea of states having right versus be a fear of the national government having too much power. So... Congress doesn't give the charter, renew its charter in 1811. But then in 1816, we get the second bank of the U.S. established in uh, Philadelphia, actually. The building still exists. It's actually not too far from uh, Liberty Bell. Um, in 1816, we get the second bank of the U.S. Um, same kind of issues. Charter expires 1836, and it is not renewed. Um, <laughs> and then we have... Um, what, 80 years of nothing. Pretty scary time where we would have banking crises quite repeatedly. Um, 
uh, we were using a gold standard, so we, we did have um, a currency. Uh, we didn't even have like a national currency until the Civil War, which is a whole different issue and a point of a whole other course. But um, after the first and second banks of the U.S., we don't get uh, another central bank until the Federal Reserve System um, is created in 1913. And it's created again as a consequence of the fact that we had a pretty severe banking crisis in 1907 with the reaction of Theodore Roosevelt, who was president, being that we needed to create a central bank once again. But even that central bank, as we saw in the previous chapter, didn't do very much um, all the way through um, the Great Depression and the begin um, after World War II. So, how did we end up getting then the Federal Reserve System to be able to exist? Well, part of it is that um, <laughs> it's it's not too central, it's not too federal. Um, and the way that we d did that, I shouldn't say we, I had no part in it, but the way that that is done is again by creating these districts. The idea is that the, yes, there is a Federal Reserve Board, which, you know, has um, seven members that um, represent the, the Board of Governors, which would be kind of our, our national way of looking at the system. But the districts have quite a bit of power as well. And those, again, are, um, I'm not going to say, I wouldn't say independent of the Board of Governors, but um, these Federal Reserve branches are owned again by the banks that are in the region. They reflect the business interests that are unique to that region. And um, they are regional district banks. Uh, again, you know, I hate to, to always go back to kind of my experience with the Federal Reserve in Chicago, but, you know, we dealt, uh, we spent a great deal of our time on railroads and automobile supply. Um, some on agriculture to some extent, but we spent a lot of our time on um, light and heavy manufacturing and the supply network and the way that rail supplied that. That was our specialty, and it reflected the, the region, the Midwest, um, that it was, as opposed to the Kansas City branch or the St. Louis branch or the Minneapolis branch, which have a bit more focus on agriculture, for instance. Um, you know, something like District 1, uh, New York, which would focus obviously a bit more on finance. Um, oh, something like District 5 even, or sorry, um, something like District um, 3, which um, right still covers our, our Northeast. Um, you know, again, the, the region, the regional economic performance is going to be reflected by um, uh, it's just going to be reflected by kind of the economic focus um, in that region and the Federal Reserve will respond to that. So then when we look at this we've got the Federal Reserve banks we've got the 12 district banks that are all um, um, responsible to a board of governors and the board of governors together with the Federal Reserve banks um, five of the Federal Reserve Banks, always New York, and then four rotating members serve with the Board of Governors on the Interest Rate Determining Committee, the FOMC, the Federal, Res the Federal Open Market Committee. The private commercial member banks obviously elect the, the leadership within the Federal Reserve branches, so you know that's the way that they have a, um, a role as well. Within the Federal Reserve System, all the national banks, so it would be the banks that are chartered by the federal government, have to um, join the system. State banks, um, they can join if they want to. And so again, here we got our map here. Again, drawn in 1913, so generally reflecting the um, population centers at the time. Here we are in 12, <laughs> a pretty wide region covering a, va a rather vast territory, whereas Pennsylvania gets split into two. Um, right, it's got two, uh, it's got three and four. Um, again, you wouldn't necessarily create the map this way um, uh, if you were to do it differently. Sorry, I, I said one was New York, I, I meant uh, two, sorry. Uh, one was Boston. Um, 
our district uh, bank is located in San Francisco. Um, and there are branch offices. I believe there's one in Boise, one in LA, and I believe one in Phoenix, I think. Um, uh, when I moved out here to Hawaii um, for a year, I was on a committee of the Federal Reserve District and I would have to fly to San Francisco about once a month. Um, yeah, we don't even, you know, obviously Alaska, Hawaii, we don't have any um, uh, uh, representation um, in, for the San Francisco branch. Obviously, you've got pretty wide territories as well. For instance, District 9 covers all the way from the UP of Michigan all the way to the far reaches of um, um, of Montana. Okay. So, um, again, the way that these, you know, to get it through Congress, to get it through um, the groups, um, originally the district banks were described as having a bit more independence than they do today. Um, the, for the most part, um, what we see is that um, the district banks don't have um, that much independence because they, they still have to respond to kind of political concerns and just general economic concerns. Where we even kind of how we drew the map has a political um, uh, influence. And you can kind of see this here is that um, study, the studies con uh, conducted in the 1913s. And again, you'll probably look at this when you look at, when you're doing your research for the term paper, um, you kind of see some of this um, discussion of where to place uh, different things. But again, St. Louis, I mean, back in the day, right, early 1900s, they just had the Olympics, they had the World's Fair. It was a big city. Today, would St. Louis have a district bank? Probably not, but, you know, that's the way it was. And again, would San Francisco have had a branch or would the branch have been located in L.A.? Probably in L.A., not in probably San Francisco. Oh, and by the way, again, that Kansas City is not in Kansas, it's in Missouri. So you've got St. Louis and Kansas City being in two, two cities in Missouri, um, having a branch um, with the uh, Federal Reserve. And so the banks, again, in that district buy shares of the district bank. That's not shares that you or I can buy uh, as individuals. And the district banks have a board of directors um, that are voted in by um, the shareholders, just as it would be with any company. You do have some other directors as well that kind of represent the general public and um, general social interests. But I'll tell you from the ground, um, having been at the Federal Reserve, they don't have as much influence as the big banks. The big banks in that district still have the, the most influence. So those member banks, they elect uh, three bankers. Those are your class A directors. Then you've got your leaders in the, um, your class B directors that are your industries that are most important. And then the Federal Reserve Board of Governors also appoints three uh, class C directors. It'd be like things like, you know, environmental, social justice, governance issues, um, you know, public um, interest issues, which, Yes, are of some concern, obviously, to a bank, just like any bank, any business, but um, bankers don't really care that much about it. So what does a district bank do as opposed to the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, which is, again, if we go back to the map here, um, in D.C., we've got the Board of Governors located. And again, we have 12 branches. So what do those 12 branches do? Well, their primary purpose at the time um, still through the early 2000s was to do the check clearing process. I mean, there used to be, um, as I even just mentioned in the previous lecture, there used to be um, several branch offices in each district all managing the actual physical handling of paper checks. Well, now they're all scanned in. And now in the entire United States, there's only one branch that actually manages all of the uh, check clearing process and that would be in atlanta so everything is now just sent to atlanta and atlanta does all of the check processing process so that's not there so then what does it do well it 
basically it does the maintenance that an economy needs. That would mean getting rid of damaged uh, notes, um, currency notes, and uh, replacing it with new ones. So at each district, we do shred the old currency. Uh, we turn it into tourist trinkets, and then we replace it with new looking currency. Uh, there's some discount lending that is happening, right? So we do administer the, dis the, um, the discount loans that are made within the district, but uh, again, those aren't gonna be very many. Um, there's quite a bit of supervisory and regulatory functions that are done. So we would go to bank branches and um, um, make sure that they are, um, um, that what they are saying is true is actually true. Um, collect, now, <laughs> If it were me, I would, and I don't think they're misplacing it here. Yeah, they're not. I don't know why they made it the second to last bullet point, but this is probably the, in my opinion, the most important thing that the district banks do is they collect regional data. They go out and they create a Bayes report. So what you can do, right? So we, if we go and went to the Federal Reserve's websites. <clears throat> what we would do is look at the Beige Book. And the Beige Book would tell us district by district what is going on. So look at that. This is how if you're at the Board of Governors, right, and you're sitting in D.C. and you ask yourself the reasonable question of, like, what is going on in this economy? Well, right, you would look at what's happening district by district. And so a big part of my job was working with, you know, not me. I wasn't leading the team. I was a young kid. But, right, working with a bunch of people together to call up malls, call up car dealerships, call up banks, you know, go in and talk to people and create anecdotal evidence that can be used um, uh, nationally, right? So you you can see here that as you read this um, here, right, is that yes, there's some data defined things, right? There's some things where we talk about, like, again, this is for Chicago, right? We're going to obviously talk about manufacturing, we're going to talk about things that are important in this region. But we're also talking about things that are anecdotally created, right? Where we talk about like restaurants and we would, you know, find out what's going on. What are individual stores and whatnot saying? And you see this district by district, um, you know, that anecdotal evidence is collected and delivered to the Board of Governors so that they can reach um, a decision about what to do. I don't know why. The authors of this textbook made it the second to last bullet point, but they did. Now, to some extent, again, you've got four rotating members. New York is always represented, but you got four rotating members that are voting members of the FOMC. So that's one part of the role. Um, uh, but it's it's not going to be, um, uh, you know, your turn, your time. On, on the panel will be um, limited. You can also, as a district bank, you obviously have, you would talk to the Federal Advisory Council, and it's not like you don't have the phone numbers of the members of the Board of Governors, but pretty much the Board of Governors is getting to set the interest rate. And for the most part, really since Alan Greenspan, especially since Alan Greenspan, most Board of Governors vote with, um, uh, the chair of the board of the Board of Governors, which is the name that most of you uh, quite often um, put with the um, uh, Federal Reserve, right? So if we go back to here, and we look at the board members, you know, these are names that you don't know, except for Jerome Powell, right? All these other people are like, who the hell is Adriana Kugler, right? Or, well, Chris Waller, I actually took class with him uh, when he was at Notre Dame. Um, so I do know him, um, <laughs> right? Um, but most of these people would be like, who the hell is that? Um, uh, yeah, so Chris Waller, he was a good guy. Um, 
Yeah, we saw, I'm trying to think of. Yeah, she's the, yeah, she, yeah. So I'm just looking here just really quickly here. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so what you're, you know, you don't think of these names again, typically. You just kind of focus on Jerome Powell, who leads, who's chair of the seven member board of governors. These board of governors, again, are all in the FOMC. And then you combine that with, New York uh, Fed president, who used to be the um, uh, San Francisco president. Um, and so um, the New York Fed president was John Williams, who used to be San Francisco. Our San Francisco branch, Mary Daly, she's actually got a very interesting story. I'm not just trying to promote her here, but um, she's got a very interesting story. Um, she actually got her, uh, she dropped out of high school. She got her GED, um, ended up going to um, Stanford, got her GED, went to Stanford. Um, and um, yeah, she has an interesting kind of history. Um, or sorry, Syracuse, sorry, not Stanford, Syracuse. <clears throat> um, uh, but she was a, a, a quite respected uh, economist uh, before. Most of these people were um, quite respected. Um, Austin Goolsby comes from uh, University of Chicago. Um, yeah, most of these people are economists, tried and true. And uh, that person's a little crazy, uh, if you want to ask my opinion, but. Not like you need to ask it, but see right here, right? So we're seeing again for each district, we got our class A, our class B, and our class C. And then you've got your branches as well that do have their series of um, uh, a board of governors as well for your, your branches. And so if we go back here to our district 12, We've got branch offices in LA, Portland, um, Salt Lake City, and Seattle. But yeah, look at the space that that covers. All the way out to the Commonwealth of uh, Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, Samoa, Sierra and Hawaii, and then obviously you guys in Oregon, but you're not too far. You've at least got your Portland branch not too far away. Okay, let's go back here. So um, in terms of, again, this kind of, you know, them being able to join it, state banks, only about 20% of state banks um, decided to join uh, the Federal Reserve System. Um, that means that then you've got your federally chartered and about 20% of your state banks, which means that in the end, about a third of all banks are part of the Federal Reserve System. Um, <clears throat> The reason why you've got so few state banks joining was that it was pretty expensive. And no one liked the idea that the um, Fed was imposing pretty high uh, reserve requirements. And so a lot of state banks, um, certainly in the past, but you know, even through today, um, just a lot of banks don't really, state banks just don't bother to join the um, Federal Reserve System. There's not a lot for them to gain, and it's not like it gives them any competitive advantage of being part of it. So when we think of the central, uh, the Federal Reserve from the um, the Federal Reserve from the federal perspective, this is all done by our again our Board of Governors, uh, people I just showed you there. Uh, Fourteen year non renewable terms uh, appointed by the president. Um, and confirmed by the Senate. The chair of the Board of Governors is the name that usually gets all of the um, attention. That chair serves a four-year term, and that um, term is, um, they can be reappointed. For the most part, these Board of Governors members are economists for the most part. Um, You'll get some that have some forays into the business and whatnot, but for the most part, they are um, economists. 
But the structure, the staggered structure of the Board of Governors is set up so that the president wouldn't be able to generally appoint a full Board of Governors, which gives them a bit more limited power over being able to set interest rate policy. So what does that Board of Governors do? Well, the most important thing they do is, again, their membership on the FOMC gives them the ability to kind of admit, determine and administer monetary policy. They're engaged in these open market operations. They do engage in you know, some test of, um, uh, testimony that they'll deliver to Congress, and there'll be some financial regulation. But for the most part, these first two bullet points are the most important things that they do. Um, they set monetary policy in the United States. The FOMC, which you've undoubtedly heard about um, um, in the news, um, this is where the interest rates are being determined. So this would be all members of the Board of Governors, all seven of those, always the New York president, and then your four of the 11 remaining um, on a rotating basis. Um, the chair of the Board of Governors, in this case, Jerome Powell, is also chair of the FOMC. And the um, uh, FOMC um, uh, meets, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, eight times a year. It's probably on the, on the next slide here. Uh, but they vote, um, I think, eight times a year. Oh, sorry, sorry, right here. Yeah, eight times a year. I was right. So what do they look at? How do FOMC members make their decisions? They look at the green book, the blue book, and the beige book. So again, the district banks, the most important product that they produce is the beige book. The names of these come from the colors that the, the um, reports used to have. So the beige book had a beige cover, the blue book had a blue cover, and the green book had a green one. Um, the green book is a national economic forecast that would be determined largely, most for the most part, by the staff at the Board of Governors. So this would be determined by um, economists with the national branch. And then the blue book, uh, same thing. This would be determined uh, largely um, with um, discussion of how we're we gonna control the money supply and how is that working through the economy. So green book and blue book are largely determined. Um, nationally, beige book is determined uh, is written uh, regionally. Um, the FOMC, what does it do? It basically sets a, um, it sets a, um, a target rate for the federal funds rate, the rate at which um, things, uh, Treasury securities will uh, be bought and sold for what interest rate they'll pay. They're not actually determining the interest rate. It's important to note here with that bullet point. They're setting the target for the interest rate. Um, and the FOMC is not actually buying or selling the securities. That's all determined by um, the New York Fed uh, because that's actually where all the treasuries are traded out of. So the, the Federal Reserve... Now, unfortunately, we just run out of time in this course, but the next chapter would have talked about the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. The most important asset that's held um, in the Federal Reserve is the um, is uh, Treasury securities. And um, this, um, you know, these securities are bought and sold um, at uh, in New York. And so... Um, you know, the FOMC doesn't get to direct that themselves. Um, and the, the trading desk, the Fed's trading desk, they just go out there and they deal with primary dealers. Um, <laughs> an interesting side note on this is that a lot of places have stopped holding uh, treasuries. Um, today, when the Fed wants to buy and sell securities, a lot of times they often turn to Warren Buffett because it turns out that Berkshire Hathaway has among the largest collection of securities out there for um, purchase and sale. Um, you know, we, as a state employee myself here for the state of Hawaii, and I guess for the state of Oregon, um, 
right? We have different policies that we have to follow in terms of openness when we uh, reach um, certain numbers here. So um, uh, if four or more members of the Board of Governors meet and they talk about a policy action, then it's an official meeting and you have to give public notice, you have to release the notes. So generally they try to keep um, things a little bit quieter. And you get sometimes too where um, you um, would try to keep things intentionally smaller or um, you would just relax the rule. Um, uh, and that would be what Bernanke um, did um, during the 2007-2009 crisis. Again, that's a little bit, you don't necessarily want that kind of thing happening, but I can understand why it had to happen that way. You know, Kevin Warsh, you know, I'm not a big fan of Kevin Warsh, but, or Donald Cohn, to be honest. Donald Cohn is like a fossil. Um, anyway, um, you know, the, what we already had seen, and we saw this in the previous chapter, is that the Board of Governors has a, um, uh, the, well, the Federal Reserve itself had a pretty rocky history in the beginning, not largely doing anything from 1914 all the way through, um, you know, all the way through um, the end of the Great Depression. And so what you see is that as a result of the Great Depression, um, you get the Banking Acts of 1933 and 1935, which are attempts to give more power and to centralize the Board of Governors' control over the system and take some of the power away from the um, individual district banks. And then what we also did, which turned out to be really good, even before the data suggested that it would be the case, but we removed governmental um, members from the Federal Reserve. So we took out the Secretary of the Treasury and the Comptroller of the Currency. It's not that the Federal Reserve Chair or the members of the Board of Governors don't talk to Treasury or the Comptroller, but the idea is get them off the board so that they don't get to determine. Um, or you don't want the Secretary of the Treasury, which is producing the debt, to also be in charge of determining what the interest rate is going to be on the debt. Um, uh, but the, the Federal Reserve Chair does have obviously have a great deal of control, and that control has become more consolidated over time to the extent that the Board of Governors just adheres to um, what the Chair wants. Um, in terms of banks, so, so even though banks own, member banks own the shares in the district of the district bank, it doesn't really get them very much. Um, <laughs> they can't really bully the Board of Governors um, of the um, district bank too much and get what they want. And so that's our structure then, right? So we've got the Federal Reserve Banks, we've got our um, 12 district banks here that are elected, um, the Board of Governors of the district banks elected by the commercial banks, and then you've got some appointments that are coming from the Board of Governors to the Federal Reserve Banks. And then you've got your Federal um, Advisory Council. And then they deliver then both data, beige book. Um, sorry, I got to pause. Okay, let's go back here. Sorry, I got interrupted here for a little bit. Um, so again, what we kind of see here is that the way that the Federal Reserve System at least was set up in um, 1913, that it had a bit more um, independence of the individual district banks. But again, this has kind of morphed over time such that the, um, the federal side of it has taken a lot more um, control. And, you know, we talk about it from time to time um, about, you know, should we make individual district banks be more powerful and give them uh, more of a say? I mean, Sure, I mean, we can talk about things like this, but um, uh, to be honest, uh, there's a, a fair amount of resistance to making a lot of changes, um, if only because um, the system really is working right now. I know that's a horrible reason to give, but um, things really are working. But the biggest changes we saw were after the, um, were with the financial crisis, with the Dodd-Frank Act. Um, and we saw a number of changes that were made to the financial system 
um, overall. And I mean, basically what we saw here was that um, we had changes. Um, we had a newly created Financial Stability Oversight Council, which was supposed to which is supposed to prevent failure of large financial firms. You've got one board of governor who's in charge of coordinating uh, regulatory actions. And then you've got the politically kind of tinged GAO uh, doing audits of the emergency lending programs of the Federal Reserve. I mean, um, all of these changes that were made under the Dodd-Frank Act are fine. It's just you don't want to. You get, obviously, you just have to be a little bit um, careful about changing things too much. For the most part, when we talk about the system um, working and that things um, are operating well, you know, the, the structure is good. Um, you know, it typically, again, is earning money. It's earning a profit. Right now it's not. But typically it's, it's earning a profit. Um, and um, it's largely um, being kept away out of, um, it's being kept free of political influence. So it's not completely insulated from external influence, right? You do get a new chair every four years. Um, you know, Congress, if it got really mad, could just completely um, eliminate it, but you're not likely to um, see things like that happening. Um, it would take quite a bit to get that kind of uh, change to um, to happen. Um, I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but it could. Um, you know, and, and people get all worked up about, and I'm not any defender of Donald Trump, and it's fine if you are. I'm just saying I'm not trying to do that here. But... You know, being president, I mean, I've never been president, but I think being president, um, maybe the thing that comes with the job is that you got to be a big grumpy with the Federal Reserve. It's nowhere, it's not new with Donald Trump. Uh, you know, the re favorite of the re of the Democrats, uh, you know, Franklin Roosevelt, he was grumpy with the Fed. Um, and I think uh, uh, Truman was also uh, grumpy with the Fed um, as well. Um, so, you know, presidents seem to always be grumpy with the Federal Reserve. And I don't know, I actually take comfort in that fact, um, uh, comfort in that um, practice that there should be some degree of uh, discomfort between the two uh, because the Federal Reserve doesn't have to really care about the politics of the situation. And obviously, politicians have to live and breathe that whole thing. Now, Federal Reserve and the Treasury, we do see these kinds of uh, disputes sometimes coming out. Um, we saw it between uh, Reagan and Volcker, where Volcker uh, intentionally put the economy into a rather severe recession in the early 1980s to get rid of the high inflation caused by Arthur Burns. Reagan probably was grumpy with Volcker, but dude, Volcker's in office. What are you going to do? Um, same thing you got with uh, George Herbert Walker Bush and Bill Clinton. Um, the Treasury always wanting Greenspan to have lower interest rates. Um, I'm not actually sure that Greenspan put up much of a resistance to that, so I'm not sure why the third bullet point is there. Um, I think uh, Greenspan complied with that. And the two did work together, Treasury and the Fed, um, during the 2007-2009 financial crisis. Um, that wasn't, that's not too big of a um, elite there, and that was good that that um, occurred that way. Um, so who does the Fed work for, I guess? You know, what kind of, um, you know, when we talk about who it's working for, yeah, we'd like to think it's working in the public's best interest. You know, a strong economy does make a stronger, you know, that is in the best interest of the public. But, you know, in terms of other goals existing, I know, like, we like to think, um, you know, goal organizations have multiple goals with things that I, I don't doubt are important, but let's just call them like the ESG goals, right? Which you've probably learned about in other business classes or whatnot, like environment, um, social justice, um, fair governance issues. This is banking and this is the Federal Reserve. It's really difficult to achieve those things as well as achieve the three primary economic goals of price stability, 
high employment and economic growth. It's hard to do all those things at once. And in fact, it's hard to even just do um, price stability and high employment. Usually there's a fair amount of a trade-off between those two. And so if the Federal Reserve is not acting in the public's best interest or um, with that view primarily in mind, it could be behaving in a way where it's the principal agent um, perspective, where the Fed is acting in its own self-interest to increase its power, its influence, its prestige, um, you know, working maybe too much with politicians in order to capture more power. Um, that generally hasn't happened. I'm not trying to be a defender of the Federal Reserve here, but you don't see too often the Federal Reserve as an agency, maybe because it's filled with economists like myself, we're generally pretty nerdy and, and more concerned about our research than to care about capturing more power for the most part. And there is this whole idea as well that the Federal Reserve, um, you know, could be acting as well in a way that kind of works with the political business cycle. That would mean that the Fed, you wouldn't want it to be acting in a way where it's stimulating economic activity right before either party is trying to win re-election for the presidency. This is actually is right as we make this lecture here in May of 2024. This is the issue that's largely facing Jerome Powell, where um, it seems that there's going to be an interest rate cut somewhere down the line. If he doesn't do it very soon, even if it's appropriate economically to do it in September or October, he probably wouldn't want to do it then because um, during the September meeting, because that's right before the November election. And then, of course, you know, if he did that, then Trump would be grumpy. Um, not that we should act in a way that we just try to avoid his grumpiness, but, you know, let's, let's not poke any bears here. And you'll be working through this issue um, again through your term paper. But, you know, as we make these arguments for the independence of the Federal Reserve, uh, generally speaking, we want that independence um, because it's just good for the control of the uh, money supply and um, the growth of um, inflation and controlling inflation. And so to the extent that we do those things, um, we see better economic um, consequences to the extent that politics is kept out of, um, um, out of the Federal Reserve. Now, you know what? I, I, I'm probably of a majority view, but let's not avoid um, or uh, ignore the fact that there is a minority view as well. Um, and that would be that in a democracy, you don't want to have an agency that's not responsive to um, public policy, to what the, you know, what the people want. And not that we should allow people to vote for monetary policy, but maybe it needs to be more um, responsive to elected officials and to the public at large. Yeah. Um, um, I'm not sure what to say here. Um, I'm not the best defender, even just for democracy as a whole. <laughs> um, just because, I mean, right, it, it's just very difficult to achieve and to achieve it well. So um, there's arguments both ways. And, you know, in your term paper, you are free to argue it either way. And I'm happy to read it either way. Okay. Um, we do have, obviously, central banks that are outside of the U.S. I'll let you kind of read those slides on your own. I'm not going to be asking any questions about those. Those are just for your own um, understanding. Okay.